Today I'd like to show you an eight volume collection of the complete works of Shakespeare, of which I am tremendously proud. This collection dates back from the 1890s, and I was fortunate enough to recently chance upon the first five volumes. I came across it and was completely overjoyed because I had come across volumes from this set many times before and had passed them over, but this time I was resolved I wasn't going to pass it over. I took five volumes of which we didn't have the volumes that contained my favourite plays. There was not King Lear, there was not uh, Hamlet, there was Macbeth, and then I managed to source from three different other sources the remaining three volumes. This set is really special, not just because it's old, not just because it is replete with gorgeous illustrations and wonderful commentary, but because it's compiled and edited by one of the greatest Shakespearean actors of all time, Sir Henry Irving. His Hamlet is up there with the original Hamlet played by Richard Burbage alongside Shakespeare on the stage. It's up there with John Gielgud's Hamlet and Laurence Olivier's Hamlet. And indeed, Irving didn't just play the Black Prince, the Prince of Denmark. He also played Macbeth, he played Romeo, he played Shylock, he played Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing, and many more great roles. So I was really, really excited. I've long been fascinated by the career of Henry Irving, so I snapped it right up. And today I would like to walk you through the set, I would like to pour over the illustrations together, and we can talk about the plays a little bit, have a bit of a Shakespeare chat, and just enjoy the set. So let me show it to you without much further ado. Okay, so let's have a little look at these volumes. This is the very first volume and you can see that they've decided to put Love's Labours Lost, The Comedy of Errors, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, Romeo and Juliet and Henry VI Part 1. I love this illustration. Would you call this an illustration or this sort of gilt uh, engraving, half gold, half not, that's very much deliberate. Uh, I thought maybe it had been worn out, but as you can see, they are all like that, the Henry Irving Shakespeare. Volume 2 has the rest of the Henry VI cycle, The Taming of the Shrew, a problematic play, famously, A uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and Richard II, a lyrical play. So this is a nice volume 2, some of his early works. Let's check out volume 3, which is quite beaten up. Some of these volumes are in good condition, others not so much, but that's okay. I like them anyway. We have Richard III, King John, Merchant of Venice, and the two parts of King Henry IV, which is uh, the play that has Falstaff. Many of you might like Falstaff. Uh, this copy, this edition, is in wonderful Wonderful condition, isn't it? It's um, hard to believe that it is so old. We've got Henry V, The Merry Wives of Windsor, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night in Volume 4. Let's check out the fifth volume. Now, <laughs> that is quite damaged. That's damaged by water. It's quite beaten up. That one very much does look its age. That has All's Well That Ends Well, Julius Caesar, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and Macbeth. That's right, Volume 5 has the dark tragedy of Macbeth, the Scottish play. And Volume 6, you can't quite see it, but it has Othello, Anthony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, and one of my favourites, King Lear. So that's a good volume to have. It's got a little bit of wear and tear, and this is Volume 7, Timon of Athens. Cymbeline, which I rather like. A lot of people don't know much about Cymbeline. Uh, the Tempest, Titus Andronicus, and The Winter's Tales. That's a great volume to have too, The Tempest. And then we have volume 8, which has Hamlet, Henry VIII, Pericles, and poems. So that would be Venus and Adonis, The Rape of Lucrece, and The Sonnets and A Lover's Complaint. So that's a good volume to have. Let's open this uh, first volume up and see what we find. I love all of this prefacing material. It's, a, it's nice to think about a simpler time when receiving a book was more of a thing. We don't have encyclopedias anymore. We don't have these huge reference books, these 
these hardback beautiful editions that are part of a subscription that a lot of you know a lot of care went into i'm thinking of adler's great books of the western tradition for example um and this tells us that the subscriber would have received a portrait of Henry Irving as Hamlet. And we have some opinions of the press. So I suppose this is a, a page of reviews. We have Punch magazine, we have The Spectator, and you can see it's a little bit stained and it's a little bit damaged. And there we have uh, a portrait of our man, William Shakespeare himself. I really love this image of course it's contested whether this is him or not but i think it is uh, it tells us that this is taken from the chandos portrait perhaps the most famous image of the bard the works of william shakespeare volume one with numerous illustrations they want you to know there's numerous illustrations uh, we have a lovely contents page here that tells us what plays are housed inside and we've got a general introduction and we've got a little piece about Shakespeare as a playwright by Henry Irving which is a really good read because he goes on to say look at that contents page that many lovers of Shakespeare try to distance him from his playwright aspect oh that's a wonderful little little illustration there isn't it um but he says this uh, is to do him a disservice and whilst he is most certainly a poet um, we need to understand that he wrote for the stage, which, you know, that's true. And fans of Shakespeare, lovers of Shakespeare, most certainly do very often try to take him away from the stage. He was a playwright. He was an actor. He would have played in Hamlet two roles. He would have played Hamlet's father's ghost and he would have played the player king. He was a shareholder in his theatre troupe and he would have had many thoughts about playing, about acting. And we can hear his voice come through in Hamlet when he tells them to speak the speech. And he gives advice on how they are to perform the play. Now let's have a little rifle through the prefacing materials. Shakespeare as a playwright. This is the bit that's written by Henry Irving. And there's his signature. That's a lovely little illustration there. When I read the plays, I've spoken a little bit about the theatre of the mind. Um, I like to read through the plays as though I am preparing for a role in the play. Sometimes I like to pretend that I am a director and I'll think about how I'm going to cast it, how I'm going to shoot the scene, uh, how I'm going to stage it, depending on the, the medium. And I find that this is a very valuable thing to do. You can see here that the prefacing material has stage history and critical remarks for each play. And then we have this beautiful illustration for Love's Labour's Lost. Now, Love's Labour's Lost was written perhaps around 1594 to 95. Um, one of the first lyrical plays, what we, what we call the lyrical plays. Um, other lyrical plays would include A Midsummer Night's Dream and Richard II. Whilst some will ascertain this, that this was one of his first plays, I see Love's Labour's Lost as quite a significant break from what he was doing, more so uh, than his break from tragedy to romance in his late period. It's a very funny, farcical, quick-paced, uh, but not popularly performed. Uh, when done, though, it can be done quite, quite ambitiously. Uh, I'm thinking of the Kenneth Branagh musical version. Here we have the comedy of errors. Um, but yes, yeah, so The Love's Labour's Lost is a wonderful play for language. If you're a lover of language, word games, uh, then you will want to check it out, even though it's not his best. Comedy of Errors, I'm thinking it was written around 1593. It's an early comedy which immediately showed that Shakespeare is a deft hand at the mechanics and plotting of comedy from the start of his career. It's his shortest play, but it has the greatest unity. Many will say it's his first, um, but it's better than the Henry VI and this one here, Two Gentlemen of Verona. Of course, you might know uh, that the story comes from Plautus uh, about these long lost twins and they are continuously mistaken for each other. Two Gentlemen of Verona, I'm going to place that play around 1592, maybe his first play for the London stage. Um, 
And there's not much to say about it. Uh, there's a great role uh, for Will Kemp, the jester, Lance, and uh, the star of the show is the dog. Now we're looking at Romeo and Juliet, 1595 to 1596, perhaps. Uh, of course, Romeo and Juliet is the most famous play. Let's be real. It's, it's potentially his most famous play. Uh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Uh, we can see here the street battle that opens this wonderful play. I actually played in Romeo and Juliet in, in secondary school. Uh, I was the uh, the role of Benvolio. Uh, there are two versions that are quite popular film versions. We have the Zeffirelli version and then we have the Baz Luhrmann version. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of the Baz Luhrmann version. Uh, I do like the Zeffirelli. I do like the Zeffirelli. I think he did quite a good job with that. Uh, there we go. We've got them biting <laughs> their thumb. Do you bite your thumb at me, sir? When we get to Romeo and Juliet, at uh, this stage of Shakespeare's career, we see him, I think, moving into his late immature phase, or he's preparing to move into his more mature phase. It's a great play. It's a great play. And perhaps one of his first really, really great plays. Um, William Hazlitt said that Romeo is Hamlet in love, but I would disagree. I would say that actually Juliet is the play. Juliet is the play. Romeo is not the best role. He doesn't have great lines. He's very wooden. Um, he's not compelling. Juliet is given some of the best poetry. And she's one of his first uh, women characters that, that really stand out. I would personally rather play Juliet, or I would see much greater potential um, as a role when it comes to Juliet. Here we see the very first Henry VI. I'm thinking this is one of his first, um, 1589 to 91, um, kicks off the Henriad, and I like to think of this almost like a like a Star Wars Game of Thrones uh, for the War of the Roses. Now let's go over to Volume Two, which contains more of the Henry the Sixth. Yeah, they're not very good plays. Um, if you want to do a chronological reading challenge for Shakespeare, I think you're most likely going to start here. Yes, it's contested. Somebody will say that another play came first. I think these ones came first. The thing is, you can really tell that other playwrights have had their hand in the making of these. You can't see very much of Shakespeare, but I'm going to do a very long podcast on this cycle, and we're going to read it in its original chronology, which, again, puts it in a sort of Star Wars situation. Here we have The Taming of the Shrew, 1593 or thereabouts. Um, a problem play, there's two kinds of problem play. When we talk about Shakespeare's problem plays, we're typically talking about the plays that kind of resist genre, the romances of his late period. But The Taming of the Shrew is a different kind of problem play uh, due to its topic. And here we have A Midsummer Night's Dream, 1595, potentially Shakespeare's first masterpiece. It's a perfect play. It's a perfect play. Um, it is ripe for the director who wants to put on a spectacle. It's about dreams, it's about plays, plays within plays and fairies. I love that illustration. Uh, it's about city dwellers descending into this sort of subterranean world uh, so as to refresh, they go a bit mad, they're wooed in the wood and then they can return to the city. Um, it's I see it almost like a fertility festival or a play that's risen out of the fertility festivals of the old days. That that looks like, a, um, if you know there's a manga called Berserk, that looks a lot like it. I think these illustrations are absolutely beautiful. Um, it's an absolute joy just to rifle through and just see how they've chosen to depict certain scenes it's an absolute joy and now we have king richard the second which is maybe his fourth or fifth crack at english history about a rightful but weak 
fucking there is no prose whatsoever in this play it's highly experimental it's written in the same vein as love's labor's lost it's operatic baroque it's lyrical and of course he took hollinshed's chronicles from 1587 as his source Look at that. Look at the detail on that. Um, he would also draw from Christopher Marlowe, but due to the overt parallels with, with uh, Elizabeth II, uh, one of the scenes, the abdication scene, was cut by the censors and only put back in after her death. Now, shall we explore Volume 3? Let's have a look at King Richard III here. So here we have Richard III from around 1592. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Not Shakespeare's best play, not his best history, but I do have something of a soft spot for it, and many great actors do too. Al Pacino and Laurence Olivier spring immediately to mind. It's the only play where we have the tragic central protagonist opening with a soliloquy directly to the audience, and here, in Richard III, we see the embryo of Iago from Othello. We see the embryo of Edmund from King Lear. But at this point, he's not psychologically complex. He's a stock Machiavelli-type Marlovian character. We've got some words here peculiar to Richard III. I love that. I love that they're pointing out the words peculiar to each play. That is such a fabulous resource to have. And here we have The Merchant of Venice, which was the first play I read all the way through. Henry Irving himself performed the role of Shylock. Of course, when we think Merchant of Venice, we think Shylock and the pound of flesh, and it's a rather problematic and anti-Semitic play. Many people don't like it when that's said, but it's true. Although, Pacino, just like in Richard III, marvellously acted the role and lent some sympathy to it. Whether Shakespeare wanted us to sympathise with Shylock or not, that's up for debate. One would protest that he is rather psychologically complex and there are aspects in the play that would suggest the playwright wanted us to sympathise with him. But at the same time, it's still rather a cruel play. One can't imagine that the Elizabethan audience would have had much sympathy for him. The cruel forced conversion at the end is not so great. Uh, I also think of Portia when I think of the merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. And here we have Henry the Fourth, there's part one and two, which was written in 1596 and 1598. Of course, when you think of Henry the Fourth, many of us will immediately think of Falstaff. I think the two parts are done the best service when they are performed as one. If you would like to see a fabulous filmic adaptation, I would highly recommend Orson Welles's Falstaff in Chimes at Midnight. It is tremendous. I love Falstaff. Falstaff, who is the cause of wit in other men. He is complex, and he is cut from the same cloth as Hamlet and Cleopatra. In the history of literature, he's in fine company, along with Sancho Panza and the wife of Bath. Critics will scorn him. But I personally love the sherry sack carrying, wench loving, purse pinching, self professed coward, and larger than life character. I love his speech on honour at the Battle of Shrewsbury and how he wants none of it. So, what plays do we have here? We've got a nice collection in this one. We've got Henry V here, um, 1599. What a fine year for Shakespeare plays. If Shakespeare plays were a vintage. We would say that 1599 is a very good vintage. If you want some good historical context about 1599, then I would highly recommend James Shapiro's book. When I think of Henry V, I immediately think of the patriotic depiction of the Battle of Agincourt. I think of Olivier again, and I think of Kenneth Branagh. I also think of Derek Jacobi 
as the chorus type figure. He's an absolutely wonderful Shakespearean actor. And here we have the Merry Wives of Windsor, 1597, probably one of Shakespeare's worst plays. There's Falstaff, but this is not the real Falstaff. This play was written to order so as to please Elizabeth due to the popularity of Falstaff. This is one of the few plays that I frequently abandon. If I find myself indulged in the delusion that I need to return to it, I don't often get very far into it before I become fed up with it. But the illustrations are wonderful, perhaps I need to read it in this edition and enjoy the illustrations. Here you can see As You Like It, also 1599. This was my grandmother's favourite play. When she was talking about Shakespeare, she would talk about As You Like It, and that's what helped get me into reading Shakespeare. We have Rosalind in this one, who may be Shakespeare's best heroine, and we have the green forest of Arden, don't we? We also have Jacques' All the World's a Stage speech. And here we can see Twelfth Night, or What You Will, written around 1601. This marks the middle period, the precise middle of Shakespeare's career, and as a comedy, it's rather perfect. Keep in mind that he wrote this after Hamlet, and I think you can tell. Now, let's flick through and try to find my favourite, which is much ado about nothing, or one of my favourites. At least it is my favourite comedy, Much Ado About Nothing and King Lear. Both of those plays are very special to me. I think about the merry war betwixt Beatrice and Benedict. And when I read Much Ado About Nothing, I like to contemplate this idea that a comedy is a tragedy all the way up until the end. I'm personally quite a sucker for romantic comedy and I could watch this one endlessly. I've seen it at the Globe, I've seen the Kenneth Branagh film, but personally I love reading it. Um, as you may have been able to tell, Much Ado About Nothing is a bit of a bawdy title, Much Ado About No Thing. Okay, let's check out this really water damaged <laughs> volume 5. We've got All's Well That Ends Well, Julius Caesar, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and Macbeth. For me, this volume is special because of Macbeth. But let's have a little rifle through. And let's start with All's Well That Ends Well from 1602. Many have hypothesized that this could be an alternative title for Love's Labours One. This story, like Cymbeline, draws from Boccaccio's Decameron, which was also quite the inspiration for Chaucer's Canterbury. Tales. Here we see Julius Caesar, 1599. This Roman history seems to be one of the most adapted of Shakespeare's plays. I've seen so many interpretations. I've seen interpretations that frame the play as though it is a piece of contemporary politics. I've seen one set in Africa. I've seen a Japanese one. I really like Marlon Brando's interpretation of Mark Anthony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. After walking out of an adaptation of Julius Caesar at the theatre, I became obsessed with the play. I ended up taking my copy of the Arden paperback of Julius Caesar. I took it on a plane, I took it abroad, I travelled everywhere with it. I beat it up, I dog-eared it, I covered it with my notes and thought endlessly about my own production, which <laughs> is still in the works, It's still in the works. Uh, we've just flipped by Measure for Measure, 1604, which Coleridge thought to be Shakespeare's most or indeed only painful play. It's a bit of a problem. Comedy, cynical in tone, but full of vitalistic poetry. We've also seen Troilus and Cressida, not one of my favorites, um, but has some marvelous poetry in it as well. Here we have Macbeth 1606, or should we say the Scottish play. Recently, Joel Cohen and Denzel Washington have come out with their filmic adaptation in black and white, which I am so excited to check out. I'll be holding it up against the Michael Fassbender, which absolutely blows me away. It's a masterpiece. 
of Shakespeare adaptation and as a film in its own right. When we read Macbeth, it might help us to think that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have the best marriage in Shakespeare. That's the killing of Banquo and him telling his son to flee the scene. Quite a heartbreaking uh, scene, that. When we think of Macbeth, we probably think of daggers of the mind. Anybody who has suffered with PTSD or suffered with replaying old memories will certainly find something to latch onto in Macbeth. Oh, we've got the forest, Burnham Forest there, moving. And you may wish to source out Ian McKellen's instruction on how to perform tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And here we have volume six. We've got Othello in there. We've got Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, so wonderful volume. Of course, we have King Lear. Let's have a look at Othello, the Moor of Venice. And who can imagine writing this progression in any year? The same year that Shakespeare wrote King Lear, he also wrote Othello, he also wrote Anthony and Cleopatra, or at least it is supposed that he wrote them more or less in around a year or a bit over a year, one after the other. Again, James Shapiro gives some great historical context with his book, The Year of Lear. This is Shakespeare's tragic period. Shakespeare must have gone through a lot of personal suffering and he was purging it at length and quite significantly over the course of this writing period. That's a fabulous illustration for Anthony and Cleopatra. A.C. Bradley, who was once the professor of poetry at Oxford, he said that Cleopatra was one of Shakespeare's four inexhaustible characters. She's in fine company with Hamlet, full stuff and Iago, and I think she might be Shakespeare's best woman character. Anthony and Cleopatra is about international politics and foreign affairs, but it's actually a domestic drama and a terrific one. It also has some of my favourite poetry, um, Caesar saying, It hath been taught us from the primal state that he which is was wished until he were, and the ebbed man Ne'er loved till ne'er worth love comes deared by being lacked. This common body, like to a vagabond flag upon the stream, goes to and back, lackeying the varying tide to rot itself with motion. Okay, we just flipped over Coriolanus there, which we might call his final tragedy, his departure from the tragic form, and now we have King Lear, my favourite piece of art of all time, in any medium, in any tradition, I adore King Lear, and like Hemingway, I read it every single year. Although, to be honest, I'm probably reading it rather consistently, so probably more often than every year. This play could not be performed faithfully for most of its run. Many have called it unperformable. Many have said that it is emotionally overwhelming and that it's best read in the theatre of one's mind. The best productions I've ever seen are the filmic adaptation by Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese Ran, wonderful. If you haven't seen it, go watch it very soon. And also Pete Postlethwaite playing the ageing, senile Lear at the Young Vic, the Rupert Gould production. This was a very special production for me. Recently we put out a lecture on King Lear, oh, well, a series of lectures as part of the Shakespeare's Masterpieces lecture series at the book club. And I must say that at one point in the lecture I came close to weeping during the recording. Um, it's one of those plays that each and every year I feel the poignance of it more acutely, more acutely each and every year. It's an absolutely devastating play. And indeed, if you haven't read it, or indeed if you have read it, I would urge you to go and read it again very soon. Now, let's check out volume seven. What, what goodies await us in here? We have Timon of Athens, which rises up 
out of the morality plays. Before Shakespeare's depictions of complex, uh, psychologically complex characters, many plays were morality plays, where the characters on stage were personifications of abstract notions. We can see virtue and vice on the stage, we can see the devil, we can see the seven deadly sins, avarice, and so forth. Coleridge thought Timon of Athens to be the leer of domestic life, and unfortunately it's relatively unperformed and was somewhat abandoned. Here we have Cymbeline, which falls into the late romances. It's a tragicomedy, I suppose, and quite marvellous, though unloved today. It's not a perfect play, but that's part of the charm. Uh, Tennyson loved Imogen and read the play on his deathbed and had a copy buried with him. Here we have The Tempest, 1611, the last full play written entirely by Shakespeare. We have the wonderful Prospero, who is a shaman-like figure and a stand-in for the playwright himself. I like to read his speech side by side with Hamlet's speech about this goodly frame, when Prospero says, Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And, like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, ye, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. And he says, we are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. The Tempest is plotless, or relatively plotless. It's magical, it's mask-like, and today it has been interpreted through all sorts of lenses. And now we bop backwards quite significantly to one of his earlier plays, Titus Andronicus, from around 1593. This is a bloodbath and a parody, or one might think it's a parody, of revenge tragedy. Enjoyable, but embarrassing for bardolators who wish that Shakespeare hadn't written this one. He was still finding his footing, his artistic footing at this point. Here we have The Winter's Tale from 1610. Not performed as much as The Tempest, which is a shame. Is it a romance? Does it fall into that category? We might call it a romance for want of a better word, but maybe we could call it a poem. Maybe we can say it's pastoral. Who can say? And here we have volume 8, which has Hamlet and Henry VIII, the poems. Hamlet from 1600. To be or not to be? That is the question. The tragedy of the Prince of Denmark is endlessly performable, endlessly adaptable and incredibly versatile. Anybody can play Hamlet. And I would recommend that when you read through Hamlet, you pretend that you are rehearsing for the role yourself. This is a lifelong reading assignment. Pretend that you are rehearsing for the role of Hamlet. Indeed, you might want to find the soliloquy, or allow the soliloquy to find you, find a soliloquy that most resonates with you now, today, and learn it by heart. Learn everything about that soliloquy, every word. Practice different weights, different rhythms. Ah, we see the, the ghost there, wonderful picture. Practice the soliloquy over and over again until you have it by heart. That's a good gateway into the play, into unlocking the power of this wonderful tragedy. And indeed the tragedy, and here we see him, <laughs> alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. Um, the tragedy for me is that Hamlet is stuck in a play. He looks around and everybody appears to him to be merely puppets, and we can almost feel him departing from the stage. He often feels more real than people we know in our own lives. We can see Pericles there, one of his late romances, again around 1607. I did my final year essays on Pericles and the late romances. We can see Henry VIII here, or All is True. I don't believe this edition has his final work, The Two Noble Kinsmen. Uh, he worked on that with John Fletcher, the same with Henry VIII. 
Here we have his poems, which is a wonderful addition to have right here because his poems are absolutely splendid. Venus and Adonis and Lucrece are good, but for me, it's all about the sonnets. We have a podcast on the sonnets, and I would recommend if you'd like another reading assignment to read them through chronologically, or at least in the order they're most often presented in, and find your favourite. The sonnets of William Shakespeare are like raw shark tests. They're little mirrors, and it's not a bad thing to go through and try to collect around 10 sonnets and see if there's any commonality for why you like particular sonnets. If you want to go to my favourite sonnets straight away, I would highly recommend you check out Sonnet 129 and Sonnet 121, but indeed I have many favourites. This is also a great opportunity to store some of these in our memory, and that seems to be the end of the book and the end of the final volume. What did you make of this little collection? It was nice, wasn't it? I liked flipping through. Very often in the evening I'll sit with a volume on my lap and I'll dip in and out. I'll pour over the, uh, the illustrations. I'll read some of the introductions and lose myself in the magical universe of William Shakespeare. So there we have it. There's my eight volume set of the complete works of Shakespeare from the 1890s compiled by Henry Irving. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did. If you like this content and you would like to see more of my book collections, uh, then do let me know and we can most certainly do that together. Let me know, when you get your hands on a complete works of Shakespeare, what is the first play you go to? Everybody goes to one play immediately. They go straight to that play. If it's an illustrated edition, they want to see the illustrations. If it's got critical commentary prefacing the play, they go straight to the commentary. Let us know what your favourite play of Shakespeare's is. And indeed, let us know your experience with Shakespeare. If you're keen to learn a little bit more about Shakespeare, deep read his best plays and figure out what all the fuss is about, then join the discussion in the Shakespeare's Masterpieces lecture series at the Hardcore Literature Book Club at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature. We've kicked off the year with King Lear and the discussion around King Lear, my personal favourite work of art in any medium and any tradition. The discussion is still very much live and ongoing and we are currently making our way through Hamlet and then we're going to move on to Macbeth and then we're going to do more tragedies before moving on to his comedies. It's a, a great year, the year of Shakespeare. Thank you again for watching along. Have a lovely day and happy reading, everybody. Bye-bye for now.